What's Cooking, episode 16. Before you dismiss the idea of Bitcoin, I want you to listen carefully to this episode. As the former University of Iowa Cryptocurrency Club president, I feel like I have some good things to say about Bitcoin. Let's have a listen. Here we go. What's cooking, everybody? Great to have you back for another episode. Another Wednesday, another What's Cooking podcast coming at you. We love to see it. Important topic today. I want you guys to buckle up because we're going on an adventure. I want you guys to put on your finance hat and start thinking about everything you know that has to deal with finance and money and all that good stuff because today we are going to be explaining Bitcoin. A lot of you guys are probably not as familiar with Bitcoin as I am. Uh, I've done a lot of work around cryptocurrency in the past couple of years. I was the president of the University of Iowa Cryptocurrency Club in the spring semester of 2022. So not only did I learn a lot more about crypto myself, but I also practiced giving presentations and leading discussions and teaching other people about Bitcoin, about crypto, and about blockchain technology and Web3 technology. So I do have a fair deal of experience, a little bit of a credibility when it comes to this topic. I'm hoping today I'm going to be able to explain some of the basics of Bitcoin with you guys. Hopefully you're going to come into this podcast episode with an open mind and a willingness to learn. I know you might have some preconceived notions about Bitcoin. You might think that it's a scam. You might think that it's worthless and it's just a stupid trend or uh, some weird thing that weird nerds talk about and it never really is going to amount to anything. Hopefully, even if you do think those things, you'll be able to set that aside temporarily and listen to this podcast with an open mind and come ready to listen to a new perspective and come ready to learn and listen to what I have to say because I feel like I have a good explanation ready for you guys. I try to break it down as simple as possible. I've been doing this for a little while now, so it's not my first rodeo going through the rundown of Bitcoin. I've organized some notes here that I'm going to take you through, and at the end of the episode, hopefully you will have a basic understanding of some of the fundamentals and some of the history of Bitcoin. But before I dive into Bitcoin itself, I think it's helpful to start with a reference point to be able to compare to something that you already know. And that's why I would like you guys, if you're willing to do a little research on the, the history of the United States dollar, if you are at your computer or if you have time, I would invite you to look up a few of the following events, and this will help you kind of get an understanding of the history of the United States dollar and how it was started and how it's gone through its life cycle and some important events that have happened with the United States dollar. And that will kind of lead into the creation of Bitcoin, why Bitcoin exists, and what problems is it attempting to solve. So if you're Willing to look up a few things and do some independent learning, I'm going to send you in the following directions. I want you to look up the Coinage Act of 1792, the California Gold Rush of 1848, the Independent Treasury Act of 1848, the Civil War and how it impacted the United States dollar, the Gold Standard, the Panic of 1893, the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944, and the Nixon shock in 1971. If you're not willing to do all that, don't worry. It's not going to be super important in this episode, but if you guys do a little research on those topics that I just listed for you, you're going to come into this with a little bit deeper of an understanding of the United States dollar, some of the problems and some of the origins that it has had and it has gone through. I think that'll kind of give you some good background knowledge as we go into uh, explaining Bitcoin 
and its purpose. So, without any further delay, let's hop on in. Bitcoin. What is it? Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency that exists on a blockchain. And when I tell you that statement, you're probably thinking two different things. Number one, what is a cryptocurrency? Number two, what is a blockchain? (laughs) We're going to dive in. We're going to tell you all about it. First, cryptocurrencies. What are they? Cryptocurrencies are a digital measure of value that can be tracked and transferred without using an intermediary. They have five important properties. Number one, cryptocurrencies are decentralized. That means they are governed by the majority, the majority rules, rather than having one central authority. That's very important to know about cryptocurrencies, the decentralized nature that they have. You're not going to have one central person, one central company making all the decisions. When you have a decentralized currency, you do not have a single point of failure. It is distributed across all of the participants on the blockchain. And that's something that gives Bitcoin a unique advantage over other fiat currencies. When I say fiat currencies, I mean like United States dollar and other national currencies that don't use the blockchain. Second property of cryptocurrencies that I'm going to share with you guys They are global. They are borderless. Using cryptocurrency is going to be a lot faster, a lot cheaper, and a lot easier to transact across the world. You won't have to sit through a waiting period as your bank tries to go through the foreign exchange process and transfer it over across to different countries and communicate with their banking system and get things processed and then you'd be have a fee tacked on. None of that is going to happen with Bitcoin. It's a global, decentralized computer network that allows you to transact from peer to peer across the world. And that leads us into our next point of cryptocurrencies, the third property. They are peer to peer. There is no bank needed. Transactions are automatically checked by the blockchain. They go through the approval process and they get verified and added to the blockchain. And so you are not going to have to rely on the operating hours and the time and the schedule that banks set for you. Bitcoin is on its own. It's its own network and it's peer to peer purely. You do not have to go through a middle third party person. Fourth property of cryptocurrencies, they are anonymous. Crypto allows unnamed transactions. So if you are sending crypto to someone else, your name is not going to be attached to that transaction like it would be if it was with a fiat currency going through a bank. That allows you to stay anonymous. You do not have your identity revealed when this transaction happens. And you can consider that a positive. If you want to stay off the grid, then more power to you. Number five, the fifth property of cryptocurrencies, they are irreversible. They have immutable transactions. That means they cannot be changed. No fraud is going to be possible from chargebacks. Once a Bitcoin transaction goes through, or rather a cryptocurrency transaction goes through, it is done. It is final. It does not give you the opportunity to go back and alter the history, what has already been done. Once it's done, it's done. That's the irreversible nature of blockchain, and that's what cryptocurrency relies on. And so you're not going to have nearly as many scenarios where the history of what's already happened gets changed. In fact, you'll have none because it's not possible on the blockchain. That was the fifth and final property of cryptocurrencies that I listed for you guys. So those are going to be the main points of what defines a cryptocurrency, Those are what make it different from fiat currencies or the United States dollar and others. That's important to know those five points. They're going to be very crucial. So you might be thinking, if we have all these properties of cryptocurrency and all of these solutions to the existing problems from the United States dollar, why hasn't this been implemented sooner? Why am I just hearing about this now? Well, as early as 1998, 
the concept of a digital currency had been introduced and attempted. However, the main issue that most of the digital currency prototypes were facing at this time was the double spending problem. Double spending is the digital equivalent of counterfeiting. So let's say you take your $100 bill, your Benjamin that you have in your pocket, you make 10 copies of it, and you got yourself $1,000 now. That would be epic. However, it rarely ever happens because the traditional financial system prevents it with control and regulation entities. And when it comes to digital currency, the challenge is to ensure that these digital assets are only used once. You know, with the United States dollars, they have those unique serial number type of things printed on them. And when you try to put it through a copier, it's not going to be the exact same type of print as the United States dollar. So those kind of help to uh, prevent those type of activities. But when you're operating digitally, guys, it's a lot easier to try to copy and use the same cryptocurrency in multiple places. You know, control C, control V, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with that. Copy and paste is your best friend a lot of times using the computer. But we don't want that to be able to be a possibility when we're operating with cryptocurrencies. We want these to be unique and we don't want to be able to to have them duplicated. So this double spending problem is what plagued cryptocurrency for a long time, ever since 1998 when it was first thought of. Nothing had really been done successfully to combat this problem. But this all changed recently. We now have a solution to the double spending problem. Crypto exists on a network called the blockchain. And you guys have been hearing me talk about blockchain so far this episode. If you don't know what blockchain is, now I'm going to explain it. Blockchain is an infinite, immutable ledger capable of recording every transaction ever made on a network. So infinite means that it does not end. It can go on forever. Immutable means it cannot be changed. The things that happened in the past are final. Ledger is just something that keeps track of transactions in a financial system. So this is a never-ending, non-changeable thing that keeps track of transactions. It records all these transactions on the network, and because blockchains are accurate and immutable, it allows the value to be transferred without a middleman, which ensures these peer-to-peer transactions. Since blockchain allows crypto to exist beyond the controls of banks and central authorities, this means that owning crypto means being fully responsible for the safe storage of your assets. So when you own cryptocurrency, you have the private keys to your Bitcoin. You have the ownership of your crypto. You can't just put it in a bank because that kind of defeats the purpose of Bitcoin. It's supposed to be decentralized. So you're in charge, guys, of maintaining your crypto safely. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in the episode of some of the best ways you can secure your Bitcoin. But that's just a little lead in as far as blockchain goes. It's just uh, data that is attached to each other in the form of blocks, and it cannot be altered, and it is secured through the Bitcoin network, which I will talk a little bit about in the future, how the Bitcoin network runs and how it is maintained here. But first, I want to take you guys through the steps in the process of a blockchain transaction. What do we do at each step of the way when a Bitcoin transaction or a crypto transaction takes place? So let's say I want to send crypto to my friend. I got a friend. It's a fake friend in this scenario. I promise you guys I have friends. The first thing we need to do is make sure that all the previous transactions are verified. So the, the ledger that I just talked about, the infinite immutable ledger, the blockchain, needs to Make sure all the previous transactions are completed and verified so that when we add on this next one, it is not altering or interfering with what's happened previously. This will ensure that I actually own the crypto that I am attempting to send because you're not going to be able to send Bitcoin unless you have Bitcoin. And in order for you to have Bitcoin, 
the blockchain would have to reflect that at one point you gained Bitcoin. So the the blockchain is going to go and check that, okay, you actually have the Bitcoin that you're trying to send. Oh, yes, he has this amount. All right, cool. So he's allowed to send it now. So the Bitcoin blockchain is going to go through and check that. Then once this is validated, the transaction can begin. And it gets recorded online in a block of data. The block is broadcasted all across the network. The network approves this transaction. It needs a 51% majority to approve from all the Bitcoin miners across the network. The block, if it gets this majority, it will get added to the chain of existing blocks, hence forming the block chain. Then, at this point, the transaction is complete. So those are all the steps of a blockchain transaction. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. If not, you can feel free to go back and listen to that at 0.5 speed or whatever you need to do to uh, kind of get the the process through your head. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the main part of the blockchain transaction. So that's going to be super important. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies all use this blockchain technology. So that's the process that it'll go through. But let's talk about the history and the origins of Bitcoin. So earlier I was telling you guys that this double spending problem had been plaguing crypto because uh, no one's been able to solve it. And then finally we did get a solution to the double spending problem with the blockchain. The blockchain was introduced at the invention of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the original crypto. It is what solved the double spending problem. It is the first successful cryptocurrency. Bitcoin was invented on October 31st, 2008, and it was actually launched on January 3rd, 2009. So we just actually came up on the 14-year anniversary, the 14th birthday of the invention of Bitcoin on Halloween. When we say invention for Bitcoin, we're talking about the publishing of the white paper for Bitcoin. The white paper is like a PDF of all the instructions and documentation of Bitcoin, its description, how it works, and all that good stuff. You guys feel free to look up Bitcoin white paper on the internet and you'll be able to see uh, the in-depth description. It's probably going to be a little more complicated than most people will be able to understand, but it's always a great idea to kind of look at it and read through it to get the full view of it. But Bitcoin, even though the white paper was published October 31st, 2008, it didn't actually go into effect and start running until January 3rd, 2009, when the first uh, block was mined. So you're probably thinking, who created this thing? Who, who is behind the Bitcoin cryptocurrency? Who, who's doing this stuff? Bitcoin was published, the white paper was published by a person or a group of people using the name Satoshi Nakamoto. To this day, nobody knows who is Satoshi Nakamoto. It could be a single person. It could have been a group of people that came together to publish this paper. They never revealed their identity. They decided to stay anonymous, and no one has ever figured out who actually published that original white paper. There has been many and many speculations and conspiracy theories linking certain people who were involved in the early days, but you're not going to be able to prove that it was actually Satoshi Nakamoto until we see the Bitcoin that is held in the original wallet gets moved out of the first wallet that was created for Bitcoin. That's the only way that you're going to be able to actually prove that you are Satoshi Nakamoto. And this wallet that holds the original Bitcoin has not been altered since its inception. And so no one has actually been able to prove that they are Satoshi. And this is very unique and very fitting for Bitcoin to not have someone that has identified themselves as the creator. Because the whole idea of Bitcoin is decentralization. The idea that not one person 
not one company, not one overruling authority controls this currency. And so it's such a a well thought out plan for the person who invented this technology, this currency, to simply disappear from the media, disappear from any sort of news or public appearance or identity reveal. Because that's exactly what the philosophy is of Bitcoin, is being anonymous and being decentralized. And it's about the people. It's about everyone that uses Bitcoin is the creator of Bitcoin. Everyone that mines Bitcoin, everyone that contributes is the people that control it, not the central authority. So I think that's really cool. You're not really going to see that anywhere else in the world. And it's part of the reason that makes Bitcoin so unique and so powerful. So I want to share with you guys some of the key properties of Bitcoin that make it different and that make it better than fiat currencies. And I've already shared some properties of cryptocurrencies in general, but these are going to go a little bit more specific into Bitcoin. So the first one I'm going to say is that Bitcoin is open source. That means the code used to create Bitcoin is public. If you want to hop on your computer and look up the code to Bitcoin, you're going to be able to see some of the early releases, some of the original plans and strategies and versions that they've went through. So I think that's really cool. Being open source kind of shows that you have nothing to hide. You're willing to let other people know how it's running. And also beyond just the code, all the transactions that happen on the Bitcoin blockchain are publicly available. So you can look up different transactions at different points in history, and you can kind of pinpoint each step of the path of the blockchain. So Bitcoin has nothing to hide. So open source is a very unique property that it has. Number two of a Bitcoin specific property. This one is super important. Bitcoin has a limited supply. The amount of Bitcoin in existence will never exceed 21 million. That is huge. Because for U.S. dollars, we have the good old Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve decides when to print more money, and they decide how much to print. At any given point, if they wake up and say, you know what, boys, let's fire up those printers. They can start printing more money, and they will start flooding the economy with more dollars. Every time more dollars enter into circulation, the value of the existing dollars decreases If there is a higher amount of dollars competing to purchase the same amount of goods, then the people selling those goods can raise their prices, which means the dollars that we have in our pockets don't get us as far as they used to. That's called inflation. The Federal Reserve printing more money, other people raising their prices, more dollars in the market competing to purchase things, It's been a huge problem in the economy, especially in recent years, especially this year, 2022. We are going through some crazy inflation. We know that the pandemic of 2020 had a negative effect on the market. People stopped spending. People were hiding away in their homes to avoid the virus. And we decided to fire up those money printers and kind of boost the economy, which we kind of needed to, but I believe that we kind of overcorrected, and we are now seeing the repercussions of what happens when you print a ton of money, and it's scary to think that the money we use in our everyday lives, the supply does not have a set schedule, the supply does not have a fixed rule, you can't predict the supply, it's just up to the decision making of the Federal Reserve. So that's a that's kind of daunting to think of. However, with Bitcoin, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin in existence. It is a hard cap. It is a fixed supply. And this fixed supply that Bitcoin has 
will theoretically drive prices higher over time. Because as we go on, the supply of Bitcoin will decrease because people are continuing to spend money to buy Bitcoin and more Bitcoin is going to be produced. So more Bitcoin will be in circulation up to a certain point until 21 million. There's going to be less Bitcoin available for other people to buy. And in addition to that, the rate at which new Bitcoin are produced also decreases over time. They have this event called the halvening, which happens every four years. The rate at which Bitcoin mining produces new Bitcoin gets cut in half every four years. And that way we will asymptotically approach this level of 21 million Bitcoin. It will be a gradual kind of a curved line going towards the x-axis if you're a graphical person. If you've taken Algebra 2 back in the day, you remember what an asymptote is. We're going to kind of slowly approach this number of 21 million, and it's going to get slower and slower going towards 21 million the further we go on. So that's kind of the, the process of the Bitcoin happening and with the supply. But this is a huge advantage over the United States dollar, guys, because we know exactly how much Bitcoin is going to be existing. We know what the supply is going to do. We know when it's going to do the halvening, and we know where it's going to end up. So this will continue to increase the price over time, and we will not get hit with inflation when you're using Bitcoin. That is huge. How about we do number three of the Bitcoin-specific properties? This is the proof-of-work consensus model that Bitcoin has, a.k.a. Bitcoin mining. If you've ever heard me or other people talk about mining Bitcoin, mining Bitcoin is the process that allows new Bitcoin to enter into circulation. You remember with the United States dollar, you have the Federal Reserve that decides to print money. Instead of printing for Bitcoin, we have mining and when I say proof of work, I mean uh, this system that they have in Bitcoin. It validates new transactions by incentivizing miners to use computer hardware to solve incredibly complex puzzles, kind of like a giant Sudoku, if you will, to verify blocks before adding them to the blockchain. The miner who solves the puzzle fastest gets to add the new block to the chain, and is awarded with an amount of Bitcoin for doing so. This is a, a process that uses computers, and it really does require a lot of energy. If you've ever heard of anyone mining Bitcoin, they probably have their computer hooked up to uh, some sort of electricity supply. It's probably going to be a, a big um, commitment as far as uh, energy usage, but... It's important to the foundation of Bitcoin for us to verify transactions to keep the blockchain secure. And for people that decide to do this, they are rewarded with Bitcoin. So you let your computer or your Bitcoin mining rig or whatever setup you have stay on and help secure the Bitcoin network. You're going to be rewarded handsomely if you do it at a large enough scale with payment of Bitcoin. So that's the kind of incentive that people have to mine Bitcoin. And that's how Bitcoin's blockchain is so secure because all these computers form together to build this network which can verify transactions at a high rate. Lastly, before I wrap up with my explanation of Bitcoin, I want to talk about purchasing Bitcoin and storing Bitcoin. The way I purchase Bitcoin is through an online exchange. You might have heard of Coinbase, you might have heard of Gemini, Crypto.com, FTX, Voyager, Kraken, some of these other online exchanges that you can go to and purchase Bitcoin. Those are centralized exchanges. So they do have CEOs, they do have people who are in charge of them but it's still considered a valid way of purchasing Bitcoin if you're not willing to commit to mining Bitcoin. 
the one I use is called Gemini, and it is ran by the Winklevoss twins. If you guys remember the movie The Social Network, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and the Winklevoss twins went to Harvard together, and they kind of both had a similar idea of creating a social network, which eventually became Facebook. The Winklevoss twins kind of thought that Zuckerberg stole their idea, and I'm not going to spoil the rest of the movie for you. You got to go watch it. But uh, basically, Mark Zuckerberg got to continue on with Facebook, and the Winklevoss twins decided to go on their own path and ended up getting into cryptocurrency. And they have their own exchange called Gemini, which allows you to purchase and trade Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. I use Gemini. I have been a fan of Gemini ever since I started using it. I think it's a great resource to purchase cryptocurrency. They have a publicly available API. API is Application Programming Interface. So you can kind of go in and see some of the coding tools that you can use at your expense to automate some of your crypto purchases and kind of set a schedule for you to purchase crypto. And I've gone through a YouTube tutorial that I found with a really cool guy that I'm going to share in a minute. And he has an explanation where you can connect your Gemini account to AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, and you can automatically purchase crypto at a set schedule. So you don't ever forget to buy cryptocurrency. It will be done for you as long as you have enough money funded in your account, which you can also do automatically. It's a really informative YouTube video. It's a guy named Rhett Reisman, R-H-E-T-T, R-E-I-S-M-A-N-N, Rhett Reisman on YouTube. He has so many good Bitcoin and crypto videos. He is a great programmer. He's a very smart guy. He uses Python code on AWS to dollar cost average into Bitcoin. And that's what I currently do as well. I want to buy my Bitcoin on a set schedule. I want to continue to buy during the highs and the lows. You guys know if you've listened to the third episode of What's Cooking, where I talked about my investing strategies in the stock market, I'm a big fan of dollar cost averaging. So I do the same thing with Bitcoin. But regardless of how or when you purchase your cryptocurrency, I need to add in a super important part on storing your cryptocurrency. And that is you don't want to keep your crypto held in these centralized exchanges like Coinbase, Gemini, FTX. Ideally, you don't want them in there. You can get by with them, but you need to understand that if you do not have the private keys to your cryptocurrency, it's not technically yours. Not your keys, not your crypto, as the saying goes. We saw some scary events happening this June with certain exchanges and certain lending platforms uh, experiencing some financial trouble and pausing withdrawals on their exchanges. So... I believe some of the popular ones were Voyager and Celsius, and I believe there was another one called Vald. That was another one that lets you kind of earn passive income on your crypto. These centralized exchanges, they, uh, let's just say, they were in over their head with some of the lending going on, some of the money movement. They ended up getting themselves through their own financial footwork, as Michael Scott would say. Their financial footwork got them in a pickle, and they ended up not having enough money to pay back the people that held their crypto there, and they are currently going through uh, some legal steps to try to resolve their issues, but withdrawals have been paused on those exchanges, so... It's very important that you guys do not keep your crypto online. Instead, what you need to do is get yourself a hardware wallet, get yourself some cold storage to keep your crypto on. 
you'll have a lot of different choices out there as far as getting yourself a cold storage hardware wallet. And when I say hardware wallet for Bitcoin, it kind of looks like a USB drive, like a little flash drive. But these are devices that hold your private keys. So the centralized exchanges, if they end up through their own financial footwork, like you just heard me say, getting themselves in a bad financial spot, they can't pause withdrawals if you have it in cold storage. That's your crypto, baby. You take that bad boy offline, it is yours. You just got to remember where you keep it physically. So the one I would recommend, the one that I use is a company called Ledger, L-E-D-G-E-R. And it's also a great resource for learning. I learn a lot about crypto on a website called Ledger Academy. They have a lot of great learning resources for you guys on there. But the actual device where you're going to want to keep your crypto, if you decide to go this route, not financial advice, is called Ledger Nano. Their device called Ledger Nano is a cold storage solution that I have used successfully. It helps me keep my crypto offline and it is in my ownership. It is totally mine. I am not liable to a centralized exchange going under. I am off the grid, baby. Let's go. If you guys want to join me off the grid, you can go to Ledger's website and you can look up uh, which cold storage, which hardware wallet you want to choose. And kind of, I would recommend going on YouTube and searching up some different uh, cold storage products before you decide on one of them. Uh, as always, do your own research, compare other options, and make your own decisions. Do not rely on other people to make your decisions. At this point, I want to direct you guys to some other helpful resources if you are interested in learning more about crypto. First, I'm going to talk about important people in the crypto industry, and then I'm going to talk about some YouTube channels that you can look at and follow if you want to kind of learn through YouTube. If that's your preferred way of uh, kind of going about this, then that's perfectly fine. That's how I do most of my learning these days. So first, I will mention important people in the crypto space. I think one good person that you could start with is Anthony Pompliano, uh, aka Pomp. You might know him as Pomp. Uh, he has a daily show and a YouTube channel and podcast and all that good stuff about Bitcoin and other decentralized uh, blockchain Web3 based uh, discussions. Mostly Bitcoin, though. He's a big Bitcoin guy. Pompliano is a, a huge player in the crypto space, he's well known. He has a Twitter account where he's constantly talking with people and he has a ton of cool interviews with other people in the industry, always pushing the envelope, always trying to continue the conversation. So Anthony Pompliano would be a huge recommendation for me. Um, another person you could look into is the Winklevoss twins, multiple people, Winklevoss twins, Tyler and Cameron. They are on Twitter. They have Gemini Exchange. Uh, you can look up some YouTube videos and some interviews with them. They would be great resources as well. There's one person that really stands alone, in my opinion, as far as being a Bitcoin maximalist, which is like ignoring all other crypto and just solely focusing on one, and that's Bitcoin. This guy named Michael Saylor, S-A-Y-L-O-R is his last name. He is formerly the CEO of a company called MicroStrategy. I think he actually just stepped down into a different position, but he is like all in on Bitcoin. Like that is his entire focus. And he has some great content on Twitter. He is a funny guy in general and just a great uh, kind of representation of what it means to represent the Bitcoin mentality, I guess. So you could look him up on Twitter, look him up on YouTube or wherever you want to find him. Believe it or not, Elon Musk is also a, a crypto type of personality. You might have heard him mentioning Dogecoin a lot back in the day when Doge was at its peak, but 
Elon has kind of gone back and forth with Bitcoin a little bit. I believe Tesla was offering purchases in Bitcoin for a while, and then they kind of had Bitcoin on their balance sheet, and then they took it off. I think he's kind of gone back and forth a little bit, but Elon Musk has some perspective on cryptocurrencies in general that you could look up. There is a Twitter account called Plan B. I think the name is called Plan B, and then the actual handle on Twitter is 100 trillion USD. This person isn't really identified, like they don't have a first and last name that they've associated with that account, but the Plan B, the 100 trillion USD account on Twitter, is a huge player in the crypto space. They are the people or person that developed the stock to flow model for Bitcoin, which is a, a way of measuring Bitcoin's growth and it uses like a exponential graph on the y-axis and it kind of predicts uh, where Bitcoin's price might go in the future. So if you're interested in some of the graphical analysis and future evaluation of Bitcoin's price, you can go to 100 trillion USD on Twitter. Great account, a lot of good insight there. They will be very resourceful if you want to learn. And then I'll throw in a couple people that are YouTube specific. Um, these are some content creators that spend a lot of time making videos and tutorials and other content around Bitcoin. The first one I would recommend is Andre Jik. A-N-D-R-E-I-J-I-K-H, Andre Jik. He is a very creative and funny YouTuber. He is a part-time magician, full-time investor type of guy. <laughs> he uses a lot of card tricks in his videos and stuff, but he knows a lot about finance. He knows a lot about Bitcoin and stocks. And if you're really into this type of content and this type of uh, learning, then I would definitely recommend you check him out. Another person you can look up I've already mentioned is Rhett Reisman for some programming help and some uh, cold storage solutions. He has a lot of cold storage reviews on there. Rhett Reisman on YouTube. And then Anthony Pompliano, I've already mentioned as a Bitcoin personality, but he also has a very extensive amount of YouTube videos from his podcast and from other interviews that you can look at. And then finally, I would just invite you to look on your own across YouTube. See if you find any creators that you really uh, vibe with and think that they have a good presentation style or whatever. The most effective way sometimes to learn about things is to kind of go down the internet rabbit hole sometimes. And as long as you're asking questions along the way and trying to find the truth, I think that you'll do a good job of learning and verifying that the information you're coming upon is correct. So always ask questions always challenge what is being presented and try to gain a deeper understanding when you're going through this crypto learning process. So I think that'll pretty much do it as far as my Bitcoin explanation. This is by no means an all-inclusive podcast of every single detail of Bitcoin. I just went over a high-level description, some of the key points, some of the main features of Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrencies in general. But I just want to leave you here with a long story short type of a too long, didn't read, give me the quick summary type of explanation. So if you're going to take away anything from this podcast, let it be this. Bitcoin doesn't rely on opinions or have any bias Bitcoin is based on math. Bitcoin is digital scarcity. Bitcoin is the cure to inflation. Bitcoin doesn't have a CEO. Bitcoin doesn't miss earnings. Bitcoin is the money of the people. Bitcoin doesn't take holidays off. Bitcoin doesn't sleep. Bitcoin is 24-7, 365, whether you like it or not. Woo! And with that, I think it's time to find out what is cooking in each of the four categories. What's cooking in sports? The last couple of years, Iowa football fans could tell you all about 
how Purdue is able to somehow, some way, figure out how to beat us when we are having a great season and we're off to a great start and everything's looking up. We have Purdue in November, it seems like, every year, and they always come through and destroy what was looking like a promising season. They take that and they throw it out the window. I remember last year I was in person in Kinnick Stadium watching the number two ranked Iowa Hawkeyes, number two in the country above Alabama, only behind Georgia. We lost to Purdue at home. Oh, it was devastating, guys. This one, this rematch has been a long time in the making, even though there's not as much on the line this year. It just feels nice to uh, to get the monkey off the back, and that's what Iowa did this week. We had a dominating performance. We took down Purdue, and we knew coming into this game that Charlie Jones was going to be a big factor. Also, Tyrone Tracy, a former Hawkeye as well, they both transferred over to Purdue, so there's a little history going on here, and the Hawks were able to weather the storm of all the Charlie Jones targets and receptions. We were able to get past that and find a way to win. The run game was looking better. Caleb Johnson, my man number two, running all over the place. We love to see that. Petrus had a okay game. He was hitting the tight ends. He was hitting Regani, or should I say Ragaini. <laughs> he was finding him uh, a couple times, but yeah, the Hawks are uh, starting to wake up a little more. Um, we're starting to find a groove, and this is the right time to get hot going into November. This is the important stretch that we need to figure out how to put together some wins and we are mathematically alive in the hunt for the Big Ten Championship so there is reason to be optimistic in the Iowa football program so don't call it quits just yet fans hold in there we got this the Chargers the good old LA Chargers were taking on the Falcons this week didn't start very good for the Chargers. We were down 10 nothing early. The Falcons were driving on us. They were getting first downs like no tomorrow. Cordero Patterson was out there slicing us up, and it was not a successful first quarter. But the second quarter, the Chargers decided to figure things out, put together some drives, ended up going into the half. I believe it was 14-10, so we liked that. Then second half come comes around. Uh, we kind of go back and forth for a while. Comes down to the final drive. Chargers are tied with the Falcons at 17. We are in enemy territory. All we need to do is set up our kicker for a field goal. Cameron Dicker is our kicker. A third string kicker because our first two kickers got injured. Typical Chargers. We are running to set up our kicker to... Uh, find a a good spot whether it's right hash middle left hash we're running the ball to kind of waste a clock away and set him up austin eckler gets stripped and fumbles oh no guys this is exactly what the chargers didn't need this is we've seen this so many times before on the return a defensive lineman picked up the ball and ran with it for about 30 or 40 yards into the other side of the field Justin Herbert is starting to run at him, starting to run him down. The defensive lineman completely drops the ball without any contact. He just absolutely puts it on the turf. (laughs) It looks so strange. The Chargers jump on it. We get a completion on the left sideline to Josh Palmer, get back in field goal range. Dicker hits the game winner, and then the crisis is averted, thankfully. Uh, Very stressful finish, as the Chargers like to always do, but... We are happy that we were able to scrape out the win there. We advanced to 5-3, and three, only one game back in the AFC, and we are statistically the most injured team in the NFL. If you've looked up the, uh, the bus ratings, this guy comes out with a bus rating. It's B-U-S, stands for banged up score. So which teams are the most banged up in the NFL? Chargers are at the bottom of the list. We are the most injured. We are the least healthy and we're still 5-3, and three, so you got to find the positive throughout all this chaos. 
quickly before we wrap up sports NBA. The Mavericks starting to string together some wins here. Luka Doncic, my boy. Wonder boy. Luka. He is averaging somewhere around 36 points per game so far. Every single game this year has been 30 points or better for Luka. He's, uh, I think there's a record from Wilt Chamberlain, like most consecutive 30-point games to start an NBA season. Luka's closing in on it, and that would be insane if he gets that, because anytime you break a Wilt Chamberlain record, you're doing something special. (laughs) My goodness, guys. Keep an eye on the Mavs. Keep an eye on Luka. He's doing fantastic things on the court. And I really think that this is a chance for him to have an MVP type of season. It's time for the NBA to finally admit that Luka is a top three player in the NBA. I would put Giannis up there. And maybe on any given night, Curry could round out the top three on any given night. KD might be there. LeBron. uh, There's probably some others that are worth mentioning in the top three, but... I think Luka has locked in a top three spot in the NBA. What's cooking in finance? This is crazy, guys. On the episode that I'm teaching you all about Bitcoin, we have a huge crypto happening, a huge crypto occurrence, acquisition. The exchange Binance has acquired the exchange FTX. I mentioned both of those earlier in this episode. It seems like uh, the CEO of FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, he has been getting into uh, some activity that put FTX in a bad financial situation, whether that is lending out their assets or taking other risks in a bear market, in a recession type of economy. Uh, It seems like all those strategies and all those uh, decisions have started to catch up with FTX, which is crazy because FTX has been the exchange that has been acquiring all these other exchanges that have been struggling financially. So now it all comes full circle. What goes around comes around. FTX has been going around collecting all these exchanges and bailing other people out. Now they need help. Oh, man. It's just a a chain reaction, just a little game of snake going around one after the other. These companies are trying to save each other. I don't know, man. Here's the official uh, tweet that came out from the Binance CEO. This afternoon, FTX asked for our help. There is a significant liquidity crunch. To protect users, we signed a non-binding LOI, intending to fully acquire FTX.com and help cover the liquidity crunch. We will be conducting a full DD in the coming days. There is a lot to cover, and this will take some time. This is a highly dynamic situation, and we are assessing the situation in real time. Binance has the discretion to pull out from the deal at any time. We expect FTT, which is the FTX exchange token, we expect FTT to be highly volatile in the coming days as things develop. I did check the price of FTT. It was in the mid-20s the past week or so. It's now down in the single digits. That is volatility. That is tough. FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, the latest in a long string of exchange collapses, exchange downfalls, I guess you could say. But uh, people seem to think, well, at least Sam Bankman-Fried seems to think that the The user's assets are secure, they're fine, they're going to be able to access them, and I don't know, we'll have to see how this one plays out. I don't have a a whole lot of prediction or insight I can give to this, but not great in the grand scheme of things. Bitcoin reacted negatively, the whole crypto market reacted negatively after hearing this. What's cooking in technology? Panera Bread a restaurant that I frequently eat at. Shout out to Soup in a Bread Bowl. Panera is bringing tech-driven bakery cafes to Chicago, New York, and other city centers. The pandemic has had a silver lining for Panera Bread, pushing its digital orders to around half of company sales, the equivalent of 3 million transactions a week from the web, in in in-store kiosks and in the brand's app. The 
trend to online ordering and delivery, a market that has more than doubled in size in the United States during the COVID-19 pandemic, prompted traditional physical retailers to respond. Panera's new store formats are just that. They cater to digitally savvy and off-premise guests who want freshly prepared food, who can pick it up in a store, or have it delivered. And they've actually announced recently that these future iterations of the new restaurant formats are going to test new tap-and-go technology for an even faster experience for Panera's Unlimited Sip Club, a.k.a. USC Unlimited Sip Club, members. The company, which is part of Panera Breads, whose restaurants include Caribou Coffee and Einstein Bros Bagels, is testing AI technology across several areas of its bakery cafe operation. AI is artificial intelligence, in case you didn't know. Earlier this year, it trialed a startup Miso Robotics automated coffee brewing system as it rolled out the USC subscription program. More recently, Panera began testing Open City's proprietary voice AI ordering technology called Tori for drive through orders. Wow, Panera stepping up their game. This is nice to see from a technology perspective, from a guy who is very much uh, in the know and interested in these uh, type of technology being used in the restaurant industry. I'm all for that. I think that Panera is trying to go outside the box, trying to kind of branch out and become one of the pioneers of embracing AI. I think this is going to be much more common in the future. If Panera can get on this early, they can kind of work out the kinks and see what works and what doesn't, and then they'll have a better strategy as they move forward with their business plan. But shout out to Panera. I'm going to have to go use some AI to order a soup and a bread bowl because that would be the ultimate dining experience. What's cooking in video games? We have another interesting lineup of video game releases this week. Three games I'm going to uh, take you guys through here. Um, not really games I think I'll be playing personally, but I'll probably watch some uh, gameplay online and see how it goes. First one is Sonic Frontiers. You guys probably know if you've listened to the episodes before, I'm interested in the Sonic Adventure 2 Battle video game came out a long time ago. So when I watch these content creators that play Sonic Adventure 2, they've kind of been hyping this up and talking quite a bit about it. So I've heard some things, but uh, it's going to be released on November 8th, which is the day that I am recording this. And if you guys are listening on this, the day of release, it would be yesterday. So Tuesday, November 8th which is Election Day, Sonic Frontiers is being released. Here is the IGN review for Sonic Frontiers. Sonic Frontiers is a delightfully weird and experimental evolution of the Sonic games so many of us grew up with. Its series of open-world islands are filled with so much variety and pieces of Sonic history, from classic platforming stages to silly minigames, that they're enjoyable to explore even when awful graphical pop-in is a constant hedgehog spine in your side. (laughs) Some of the new stuff Frontiers tries out, like the smart toggling between 2D and 3D perspectives out in the open world, or the cyberspace levels, are fantastic ways to pack as much Sonic goodness as possible into one package, while others, especially combat, are uninteresting experiments gone wrong. Still, I largely enjoyed my time running around in Frontiers, making it feel like a very promising first attempt at what could be a bright new era for Sonic and friends. When I said I in that situation, that's just the IGN reviewer. It wasn't me saying that, but sounds like there's some good and some room to improve here. I'm going to have to watch some more gameplay and see what some of my uh, favorite streamers think of it, but... If you guys are fans of uh, these 3D platformers and combat type of games and you're interested in Sonic, give it a try. Sonic Frontiers, out now. Next game that's going to be released this week, God of War Ragnarok. I believe that's being released Wednesday, November 9th. So if you're listening on the day of release, that would be today. God of War Ragnarok. Here is the description for that game. Journey through dangerous and stunning landscapes while facing a wide variety of enemy creatures, monsters, and Norse gods as Kratos and 
Atreus search for answers. I don't really consider myself a, a player of these type of games. I don't really uh, have a much of an interest in God of War Ragnarok, but it seems like the video game community is anticipating the release of this game, so maybe I'll look up uh, some reviews when it comes out, and maybe I'll watch some gameplay. It's supposedly available on PS4 and PS5, so either one of those systems you'll be good to go. If you're interested, check it out, and we'll move on. Third game that's coming out, this one might be the coolest of the three. Among Us VR. <laughs> if you guys know the game Among Us, it's pretty popular. You, uh, you go around completing these tasks, and one person is kind of selected as the person that's going around trying to kill other people, and then you have to, like, come back and discuss with others and see, like, argue, it wasn't me, it was this guy, I saw him do this, and, like, it's a, a social, like, conversation type of game. They're bringing that to VR, so the virtual reality port of the 2018 online social game arrives on November 10th. Uh, they believe that's Thursday, so, wow, three three back-to-back -back, uh, game releases here this week, and it's going to cost $9.99. Among Us VR allows you to play with up to 10 players. You assume the role of either a crewmate or an imposter, with a former looking to complete all the tasks around the map, while the players posing as imposters try to kill all the crewmates without being detected. The VR port adds a new level of suspense and chaos that will provide a, a fresh perspective for longtime players. In the gameplay trailer released back in April, you can see that the game shifts to a first-person perspective. Whew! Man, that, that sounds interesting. I definitely need to look up some gameplay for this. Adding to the level of chaos is the inclusion of hands that you can flail around as you run or use to physically point fingers at an individual you feel may be the imposter in the group. <laughs> oh boy, I can already see a lot of YouTubers and content creators are going to be flailing their arms around and pointing at each other and getting into heated discussions, so... I, I'm definitely anticipating some gameplay to be released for this. Once again, that's Thursday, November 10th. You can get it for 10 bucks. Sounds like you are going to need some sort of uh, MetaQuest or VR equipment to play. But I think it would be super cool if you have a group of friends who enjoy this game to hop on, try it out, and see how it works. Thank you all for listening. That's going to do it for this episode episode 16 of the what's cooking podcast explaining bitcoin i think that bitcoin is going to take over eventually might not be today might not be tomorrow might not be this year might not be next year i tend to have a longer time horizon than most i am a long-term thinker i am a long-term investor so i am patient with the process and i think that if you guys put even just a small amount of money into Bitcoin and you learn about it and you store it safely. Uh, maybe you come back in 10 years, maybe you come back in 20 years and you find that it has blossomed in, into a significant amount that you might not have expected. So there you have it. What's underscore cooking on Twitter. What's underscore cooking on Instagram. Follow me on YouTube, Facebook, I have a link tree in the bio of my social medias to keep you guys connected with all the content creation platforms I'm on. Three episodes in a row with no guests, guys. I know you're, uh, you're itching for a guest. So am I. We're communicating with other people. We're trying to set something up. Maybe I'll get one for next week. I'll do my best. Otherwise, I will find another interesting topic and we will see you next Wednesday. See you!